to the first edition of Saluki Mania this year. I'm uh, reporter Todd Hefferman, and with me is sports editor Les Winkler, and we're here to talk some Saluki football. Uh, SIU starts the season Thursday night at Eastern Illinois, 6.30 p.m. kickoff at O'Brien Field in Charleston. That game will be on the Saluki uh, radio network uh, on Saluki All Access, and uh, it'll be on our website, too. We'll be blogging there and uh, doing the live scoring, but... Uh, big year for SIU now. This, they're coming off their second losing season. Uh, they they want to get back in the playoff race, obviously. They picked seventh in the conference, even though they have a couple good off all-conference players. Um, what do you think is key for SIU this year to make a turnaround? Well, the, there's two things that I see as, as just vital. is uh, putting together, patching together an offensive line. They've lost uh, a couple very talented, some of the best linemen they've ever had in their history and, and cobbling that line back together into a cohesive unit. And the biggest single thing that I see is, is getting a defensive secondary that's uh, capable of defending in, in long yardage situations. The, the Salukis just got killed so many times last year. They'd force a third and long and then give up then give up a long pass. And the, the really frustrating thing is so many times they actually had a defender close enough to make a play and they just didn't make those plays. And it was just it was infuriating as a fan and just frustrating when you had to write about the same thing week after week. So, uh, you know, hopefully they get some of that shored up and uh, um, uh, their defensive set, front seven should be really, really strong, which should help the transition with the newcomers in the defensive secondary. I do think they've upgraded in the secondary talent-wise. I was a little, you're always a little weary of FBS transfers, even though Dale Lennon has had really good luck with the, bringing in guys from other FBS schools. But uh, Emmanuel Sarin and uh, Carlton Lewis uh, had terrific backgrounds, and they, they played really terrific in practice. And I, I thought Emmanuel surely was going to start. I wasn't sure about Carlton uh, because they had Luke Thuston on one side, and DJ Cameron made interception almost every practice. And I thought very well they could have gone with him just because he'd been in the program longer. But they're going to go with Lewis, and I guess when you play at Clemson, you're good enough to play at SIU. So... <laughs> That's probably an upgrade there, uh, athletic-wise, and they seem to be filling in with the system. But j just like you said, tackling was an emphasis for them from since day one because they were so horrible at it last year. They just they had guys right there to make the play, which is what the scheme designs them to do. And you miss a tackle in the secondary at seven points. Well, you know, and that, like I said, that that was the incredibly frustrating thing. I mean, you could tell the kids were coached well enough because they were in position to make the plays, but they just weren't making the plays. You know, and at some point. You know, that's got to be on the players because the coaches had them in, in the proper position more often than not. And they do have they do have a few more returning starters uh, in, on the defensive side now than the offensive side. But I think they, they I think they a little bit know what, more what they are, too, uh, what they're trying to do scheme-wise. And, and the front seven, I, I hope, you know, and I'm sure everybody hopes that they can dominate well enough that the secondary isn't that big of a factor. You know, Kayon Swanson and, and Ken Boatwright last year just had some monster games. And Jason DeManch is just – he reminds me of Chauncey Mixon who played a few years ago. I think he's got that kind of crazy athleticism. I don't think he's as uh, big and rangy as, as Chauncey mm -hmm. was. And Joe Ocon is just kind of that always in the right place at the right time, physical type linebacker. So you you got to like that part of their, their lineup. For Swanson to leave them in tackles from that position that's just designed to kind of clog people up, that's what's amazing to me. It's yeah. the first time, I think, since 1993 that somebody from the defensive line led them in tackles. And Ken Boltwright, another defensive lineman, was only one tackle behind him. And yeah, especially that guy in the middle of the line, the nose tackle. For, for, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. So he's back. Boltwright's back. Uh, Eza Obiora is probably going to – he's not going to start, but he's supposed to be available for the Eastern game. He's got a turf toe injury that's kind of livid in the last few days. But he's a very good player, and Blake Miller's a very good player. Blake Miller's supposed to start. But uh, offensively, they, to me, they have to establish a, a go-to receiver because we all know Michael Pruitt's going to get a lot of attention. I think they will be able to run the ball just as well as they did last year despite missing Bomer and David Pickard. I like the three running backs they have. All three of them are going to see action. And most of the guys on the offensive line have started one game or another. Right. It's just they're all in different positions this time. Yeah, you know, you, they need that receiver that's going to stretch the field. They haven't had that, and they probably not since Alan Turner graduated. Uh, yeah, you know, David Lewis has is, is, is got a great football body for, uh, for this level of football. Um, Stephen McKinney has speed and has shown that he can be very dangerous when he gets the ball out in space. And if they can create a little 
if if the other team's defense has to respect that and and, to, and give McCall and Struther and Col uh, Coloco room to operate underneath, it, it could be a pretty good pretty good offensive football team. And I think the other side of that is Corey Faulkner. I think really grew up in the last half of the year last year. Uh, he was thrown into a pretty tough situation last year, and you could see you could see his progression week to week as the year went on last year. I think he looks a lot more comfortable this year. Uh, and he's he's probably going to have to be comfortable with uh, with Eastern coming in. They have a couple of returning starters uh, up front and in the secondary. Uh, they have a new coach, Dino Babers, that was the wide receivers coach and the special teams coordinator at, at Baylor. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo is not quite Robert Griffin the third, but you know he he did he did uh, he was picked off three times, but he also is a returning starter at the quarterback spot, a junior. He's got his leading rusher back, who had three touchdowns against the Salukis and his leading receiver back, Chris Wright, that is going into top 15 all time for yardage for the Panthers. They have all five returning starters on the offensive line this year, but uh, they will not be shut out. I can guarantee you that. But the thing is, can SIU keep this game in the 20s instead of the 30s and the 40s? You know, Garoppolo's one of them. He's a dangerous guy. I mean, he, can, he, he gets out of the pocket. He makes plays, and he's got that uh, – He's just got that ability to extend plays and just you know run away from tackles and reverse his field and do kinds of crazy things and that puts a lot of pressure on your defensive backs. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting game for him. It's going to be a good test. It'll be a great test because they have four wide receivers. They're going to throw at them, so we're going to find out in a hurry. <laughs> SIU secondary is is up to the up to the challenge this year, and it's it's a big game because SIU their first three games are critical because the Valley is going to be really rugged this year. I don't think anybody's going to win the Valley by more than a game or two. Uh, South Dakota is the wild card. SIU does not play them, but they have a lot of returning starters back too. They have a lot of home games against some big opponents. Uh, so SIU has to go 2-1 and one these first three games, in my opinion, to, to have a shot at the playoffs. No, it's a big game. It, it really is. I mean, you, football's a strange, football's a strange uh, animal because you can say that the opening game is a must-win. But for SIU, you're right. For SIU to go back to football, to the playoffs, this, this is a must-win game, I think. And if confidence-wise, even the, the fan base is not going to be encouraged if they go to Eastern and lose to a team picked eighth in the OVC, which is much weaker than the Valley Football Conference. Uh, and, and Dale Lynn has never had back-to-back -back losing seasons until last year. This is his first year with his four-year players on his roster. There's a handful of guys that were originally recruited by Jerry, and Dale convinced them to stay. Uh, or they, they may have redshirted, I think, in 2008. So this is really his, his team. It's his, it's his turn to, to prove, I think, that he can win with his own players. You know, and yeah, I, I, know, I know we, we pointed out some Eastern strengths or whatever, and you know, I'm not looking at this as a worst-case scenario at all. I, I think this SIU team has a chance to be pretty good mm -hmm. if, if a couple things fall into place, but, but by no means that doesn't change the situation that exists. This is a game they need to win. We'll see if they do. Thursday night, 6.30. Uh, our live blog is going to start at 6 p.m. on the southern.com, and hope to see you there.